Hey everyone, and welcome back. I'm Grante, and today on the show, we've got another episode in my audiobook series, which right now we're going through the 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth uh, by John Maxwell. Today, we have chapter four, The Law of Reflection. Learning to pause allows growth to catch up to you. Enjoy. This video is part of an audiobook series featuring the 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth. Live Them and Reach Your Full Potential, written by John C. Maxwell in 2012. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or check out my website for downloads. Chapter 4, The Law of Reflection. Learning to pause allows growth to catch up with you. And it begins with a quote from Peter Drucker. Quote, Follow effective action with quiet reflection. From the quiet reflection will come even more effective action, end quote. There are many different ways of growing and an infinite number of lessons to be learned in life, but there are some kinds of growth that come to us only if we are willing to stop, pause, and allow the lesson to catch up with us. I experienced one of those in March of 2011. A Change in Paradigm I was traveling on an extended speaking trip and I landed in Kiev, Ukraine, on one of my stops. While I was there, I was scheduled to speak three times to a group of about 5,000 business people. I had been to Kiev several times before and enjoyed both the place and the people. About an hour before the first scheduled event, I met my Ukrainian translator. We chatted a while so we could get to know each other. A few minutes into the conversation, he said, I've read several of your books and you say that you want to add value people, but that's not easy here. People don't trust leaders, and with good reason. Leaders here don't add value to others. He then added, I sure hope, though, that you can help them. His words left quite an impression on me, and what he told me prompted me to recall conversations with my good friend Jim Dornan, the leader of Network 21, an organization that works in many of the countries that were once behind the Iron Curtain. Jim had told me that in any country where the government was crooked and the leaders were crooked and selfish, being able to circumvent authority and working the system were seen as virtues. Because I still had a little time before I had to speak, I went to the green room so I could pause and reflect on what I had just learned. I was feeling emotional and wanted to take the time to let my thinking catch up to my feelings, and so I started asking myself some questions. How was I feeling? And the answer was sad. Living under communist rule for generations had beaten people down, discouraged them, and made them cynical. It's hard to get ahead when you have little hope. What could I do? I could show them my heart. For some of these people, perhaps no leader had ever told them that he cared about them and wanted them to succeed. How could I do that? I could let them know that I knew what their situation was and that I felt for them. I could tell them that I would be just like them if I had grown up in that environment, but that there is a higher road for a leader, one where leaders add value to others. I could help them understand that even if they had never been valued by their leaders, they could become leaders who added value to others. They could become change agents for the future success of their country and themselves. I then took a moment and prayed, asking God to help me deliver that message with clarity and integrity. I didn't completely abandon what I planned to speak about that day, but I sure modified it for and tailored it to my audience. And one of the first things I said, which I repeated often that first day, was, My name is John, and I'm your friend. I said it sincerely, and I also used it to help soften some hard but humorous truths I was delivering. At first, they weren't sure how to react to the statement. After a while, they started to anticipate it. By the end of the day, when I said it, they knew a zinger was coming and they'd laugh in anticipation. And the next day, when I came in and prepared to, see, to speak, my translator said that everyone was saying the phrase to one another. That's when I realized that they understood that I was cheering them on and really wanted to help them. It's never been enough for me to just show up and give a good speech when I've been invited to an event. Every time I speak, I want to do two things. One, add value to the people I talk to, and two, exceed the expectations of the person who invited me. It's likely I would have failed on both counts on this trip if I hadn't taken the time to pause to let the honest insights from my interpreter soak in and change my agenda to match what my audience needed. The Power of Pausing 
If you are nearly as old as I am, you re may remember an old slogan once used by Coca-Cola. They called Coke the pause that refreshes. That's what reflection is to someone who desires to grow. Learning to pause allows growth to catch up to you, and that is the law of reflection. Here are some of my observations concerning the power of the pause and how reflection can help you to grow. Number one, reflection turns experience into insight. For over 2,000 years, people have been saying that experience is the best teacher. According to one expert, the earliest recorded version of this wisdom came from the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar, who wrote, Experience is the teacher of all things in De Bello Civili. With all disrespect, or with all due respect, I have to disagree with that statement. Experience is not the best teacher. Evaluated experience is. The only reason Caesar was able to make that claim was because he, has, he had learned much by reflecting on his life and writing about it. There's an old joke that experience is a hard teacher because the test is given first and the lesson is given afterward. That's true, but only if the person takes time to reflect after the experience. Otherwise, you receive the test first and the lesson may never come. People have innumerable experiences every day, and many learn nothing from them because they never take the time to pause and reflect. That's why it is so important to pause and let understanding catch up with us. I once heard that at the turn of the century, there was a buggy whip factory that had made major improvements in their manufacturing process. They made the best quality whips, and they were continuing to improve them. No other manufacturer in the industry compared. There was just one problem. They were working at a time when the automobile was being introduced, and it wasn't long before the entire nation would change to the horseless carriage. The company soon went out of business. I can't help wondering what the outcome might have been if the leaders of the company had taken the time to pause, understand what their experience was trying to teach them, and make changes in the course they were on. Observation 2. Everyone needs a time and a place to pause. I have yet to meet a person who doesn't benefit from pausing and reflecting. In fact, stopping to reflect is one of the most valuable activities people can do to grow. It has much greater value to them than even motivation or encouragement. Why? Because pausing allows them to make sure they are on the right track. After all, if someone is going down the wrong road, he doesn't need motivation to speed up. He needs to stop, reflect, and change course. In my book, Thinking for a Change, I encourage people to identify or create a thinking place. Did I do that because there is some magic in having a designated place to pause and think? No, I did it because if you go to the trouble to create a place to pause and think, and you schedule the time to go there, you will probably actually use it, and you will probably benefit from it. Most people are pretty busy. There are a lot of demands on them, and they rush from place to place trying to get things done. Along the way, they have certain experiences that are life markers. They go to a place or are part of an event or meet a person that, in some way, marks them for life because something important happened. Often, these markers identify them for a time of transition, change, or transformation. If we don't take the time to pause and reflect, we can miss the significance of such events. Reflection allows these experiences to move from being life markers to life makers. If we pause to allow growth to catch up with us, it makes our lives better because we not only better understand the significance of what we've experienced, but we can implement changes and course corrections as a result. We are also better equipped to teach others from the wisdom we have gained. Observation 3. Pausing with intention expands and enriches thinking. Study the lives of the great people who have made an impact on the world, and you will find that in virtually every case, they spend a considerable amount of time alone thinking. Every significant religious leader in history spent time in solitude. Every political leader who had an impact on history practiced the discipline of solitude to think and to plan. Great artists spend countless hours in their studios or with their instruments not just doing, but exploring their ideas and experiences. Most leaders leading universities give their faculty time not only to teach, but to think, to research, and to write. Time alone allows people to sort through their experience, put it into perspective, and plan for the future. If you are a leader, you can probably take the normal busyness of life and multiply it by 10. 
Leaders are so action-oriented and have so many responsibilities that they are often guilty of moving all the time and neglecting to stop and take time to think. Yet, this is one of the most important things leaders can do. A minute of thought is worth more than an hour of talk. I strongly encourage you to find a place to think and to discipline yourself to pause and use it because it has the potential to change your life. It can help you figure out what's really important and what isn't. As writer and Catholic priest Henry J. M. Newen observed, quote, When you are able to create a lonely place in the middle of your actions and concerns, your successes and failures slowly can lose some of their power over you, end quote. Lesson four, when you take time to pause, use your eyes. When you take time to pause and reflect, there are four basic directions, all beginning with the letter I, that your thinking should go. First, investigation. There's a corny old joke about two guys who have been given the job of cleaning out a stable. They're up to their ankles in horse manure, and the other says, one says to the other, there must be a horse around here somewhere. Some things are obvious and don't require reflection to figure out. Others require a person to play detective. The great scientist Galileo said, quote, all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them, and that takes investigation, end quote. Pausing means more than just slowing down to smell the roses. It means stopping and really figuring them out. That generally requires a person to ask questions, which I'll discuss in the next section of this chapter. The thing to remember is that continual growth from experiences is only possible when we discover insights and truths within them. That comes from investigation. The second I is incubation. Incubation is taking an experience of life and putting it into the slow cooker of your mind to simmer for a while. It is very similar to meditation. It's like the flip side of prayer. When I pray, I talk to God. When I meditate, I listen to Him. Incubation is listening and learning. I am continually putting quotes and ideas in my mental crockpot to let them incubate. These days, I do that by putting them in the Notes app of my iPhone. I keep them there for days, weeks, and months, and look at them often to reflect about them. Here are some of the quotes I'm currently thinking about. If you're not on the table, you're on the menu. Don't, you, you don't wait or rush yourself out of a crisis. You work yourself out. The mark of an effective leader is one who absorbs the punishment without surrendering the soul. I give ideas as long as they need until I discover an insight or experience the next I, which is illumination. Jim Rowan remarked, quote, At the end of the day, you should play back the tapes of your performance. The results should either applaud you or prod you, end quote. What he's talking about is illumination. These are the aha moments in your life, the epiphanies when you experience sudden realization or insight. It's when the proverbial light bulb turns on. Few things in life are more rewarding than such moments. I find that I experience moments of illumination only after I spend time investigating an idea and then allowing it to incubate for a period of time. But such moments are the reward for committing time and effort to pausing and reflecting. <clears throat> Finally, illustration. Most good ideas are like skeletons. They provide good structure, but they need meat on the bones. They lack substance, and until they have it, they aren't really that useful. What would a good speech look like without good illustrations? A flat outline. What would a book be without fleshed out ideas, good stories, and insightful quotes? Boring. Illustrating is the process of putting flesh on the bones of ideas. Author and firefighter Peter M. Lashock believes, quote, All of us are watchers of television, of clocks, of traffic on the freeway, but few are observers. Everyone is looking, but not many are seeing, end quote. That isn't necessarily true for people who find a place to reflect and who are intentional about pausing to allow learning, learning to catch up with them. Good questions are the heart of reflection. Whenever I take time to pause and reflect, I begin by asking myself a question. Whenever I'm thinking and reflecting, and I feel like I have hit a roadblock, I ask myself questions. If I'm trying to learn something new or delve deeper into an area so I can grow, I ask questions. I spend a lot of my life asking questions, but that's a good thing. 
As author and speaker Anthony Robbins says, quote, successful people ask better questions, and as a result, they get better answers, end quote. I cannot overemphasize the importance of asking good questions when it comes to your personal growth. If your questions are focused, they will stimulate creative thinking. Why? Because there is something about a well-worded question that often penetrates to the heart of the matter and triggers new ideas and insights. If your questions are honest, they will lead to solid convictions. If you ask quality questions, they will help you to create a high-quality life. Sir Francis Bacon, English philosopher, statesman, scientist, lawyer, jurist, author, and pioneer of the scientific method, asserted, quote, If a person will begin with certainties, he will end in doubts. But if he will be content to begin with doubts, he will end in certainties, end quote. Personal Awareness Questions Teaching other people how to ask questions effectively can be a difficult challenge because the questions they ask usually must be tailored to the situation. Personal Awareness Questions Teaching other people how to ask questions effectively can be a difficult challenge because the questions they ask usually must be tailored to the situation. So, Perhaps the best way to give you insight on this issue is to share with you a series of questions I've asked and answered to help me develop personal awareness. Question 1. What is my biggest asset? I believe my greatest asset has always been attitude. I first learned the value of a positive attitude from my father, Melvin Maxwell, who overcame his naturally pessimistic outlook by reading books by people like Norman Vincent Peale. My wife, Margaret, also has an uncommonly good attitude. Over the years, we have occasionally wondered why others seem to have so many more problems than we do. We finally come to the conclusion that we don't have fewer problems, we just don't allow the problems we have to get us down or distract us from what we believe is important. What has answering this question done for me? It has not only encouraged me to continue to cultivate a positive attitude, but has also reminded me that one of the best things I can do for others is speak positively into their lives, let them know I believe in them, and encourage them in their journey. Number two, what is my biggest liability? Without a doubt, having unrealistic expectations is a major shortcoming in my life. Because I am naturally optimistic, I underestimate how much time, money, and effort most endeavors will require, and that can get me into trouble. What has answering this question done to help me grow? It has tempered my expectations toward others. Modifying my expectations to be more realistic has helped me set up my team to succeed rather than to fail, and it has also helped me to create more realistic goals for team members and the organizations they serve. Question 3. What is my highest high? Without a doubt, my family is the source of the highest highs in my life. Margaret is my best friend. I cannot imagine life without her. And now we are enjoying our favorite season of life as grandparents. Question 4. What is my lowest low? Ironically, my lowest lows have also come as a result of family. Why? Because I love my family members so much, yet I have to let them make their own choices. That can be tough for someone with my personality. Years ago, when my children were still teenagers, I was having a conversation with Ron Blue and Howie Hendricks, and I asked them, when is this parenting thing over? They told me it never ends, and they were right. How has it helped me to grow, knowing that the best and worst of my life is related to family? It has helped me enjoy the times I have with my family and to stay out of my grown children's decision-making unless they ask for advice. Question 5. What is my most worthwhile emotion? I don't think there is a more worthwhile emotion than love. We live at our best even when we love what we do, love our family and friends, even love our enemies. As a person of faith, I know this is the standard that God has set for me, and it also is the desire of my heart. How does knowing this help me to grow? Love is a choice, and it often requires effort. So to love others as I would like to do, I must be intentional about it and choose to love people every day. Question 6. What is my least worthwhile emotion? The least attractive emotion not only for me but for any person is self-pity. It is destructive and self-serving. In Earth and Altar, Eugene H. Peterson says, quote, Pity is one of the noblest emotions available to human beings. Self-pity is possibly the most ignoble. 
Pity is the capacity to enter into the pain of another in order to do something about it. Self-pity is incapacity, a crippling emotional disease that severely distorts our perception of reality. Pity discovers the need for others in love and healing, and then fashions speech and action to bring that strength. Self-pity reduces the universe to a personal wound that is displayed as a proof of significance. Pity is adrenaline for acts of mercy. Self-pity is a narcotic that leaves its addicts wasted and derelict. End quote. Knowing the negative effects of self-pity reminds me to avoid it categorically. It cannot help me, and it will always harm me. Question 7. What is my best habit? H.P. Lytton, Chancellor of St. Paul's in London in the 1800s, observed, quote, What we do on some great occasion will depend on what we are, and what we are will be the result of previous years of self-discipline, end quote. I believe that 100%. That is one of the reasons I work hard to follow through on daily disciplines. I believe a person's secret of success is found in his daily agenda. Perhaps the greatest value of questioning myself in this area is that it exposes my weakness regarding the discipline for my health. Developing good eating habits has been a lifelong struggle, and I did not exercise regularly until after I suffered a heart attack. I continue to work hard to grow in this area. Question 8. What is my worst habit? Without a doubt, my worst personal trait is impatience. It was part of my early nature as a child, and it has become ingrained in me as a habit. When I was a child, we used to visit my grandpa Maxwell, and it never failed at that point while we were there. He would sit my brother Larry and me down in two chairs and offer to pay us a nickel if we would sit quietly in those chairs for five minutes. Larry always earned this nickel, and I never did, not one time. I have learned that there are things in life that you have to work for and that there are those things that you have to wait for. I'm still trying to grow when it comes to waiting. I suspect that this will be a goal of mine until the day I die. Question 9. What is most fulfilling to me? The thing I enjoy doing most is communicating to other people. When I communicate, I know I am in my strength zone. I feel the most fulfilled and I make the greatest impact. Every time I do it, I have a deep sense that I was made for this. Early in my career, knowing that communication was fulfilling to me prompted me to become a better speaker, because back then I wasn't very good at it. For more than 10 years, it was one of the top areas I dedicated myself to when it came to growth. I continue to try to grow as a communicator, but the value I receive from doing this question today is that it helps me to stay focused, so I'm doing what returns the most value to others and to myself. Question 10. What do I prize most highly? I value nothing as highly as I do my faith. It forms my values. It guides my actions. It has been the foundation of my teaching on leadership. It is my source and my security. Mother Teresa said that faith keeps the person who keeps the faith, and I have found that to be true. Author Philip Yancey described faith as, quote, trusting in advance that will only make sense in reverse, end quote. Having faith and knowing its value in my life helps me to have a divine perspective every day. I need that because I could otherwise easily get off course. The previous 10 questions were ones I actually asked myself to prompt me to reflect and help me grow in the area of self-awareness. You can ask yourself questions in just about any area of life to help you pause and focus. For example, if you wanted to grow in the area of relationships, you could ask yourself these following 10 questions. 1. Do I value people? 2. Do people know that I value them? 3. How do I show it? 4. Am I a plus or a minus in most of my important relationships? Number five, what evidence do I have to confirm my opinion? Six, what is the love language of the people that I love? Seven, how can I serve them? Eight, do I need to forgive someone in my life who needs to be given grace? Nine, who in my life should I take time to thank? And ten, who in my life should be receiving more of my time? Alternatively, if you wanted to pause and think about where you are in the area of personal growth, you could ask yourself the following 10 questions. 1. Do I know and practice the 15 laws of personal growth? 
Number two, which three laws do I do the best? Number three, which three are my weakest? Number four, am I growing daily? And number five, what am I doing daily to grow? Number six, how am I growing? Number seven, what are the roadblocks that keep me from growing? Number eight, what are the breakthroughs that I need to keep growing? Number nine, what were the potential learning moments I experienced today and did I seize them? Finally, 10, am I passing on to someone what I am learning? What you want to accomplish in life and where you are in the journey will determine what areas you most need to think about today, tailoring the questions to yourself. But the most important thing you must do is write out the questions and write out the answers. Why? Because you will discover that what you think after you write the answer is different from what you thought before you wrote it. Writing helps you to discover what you truly know, think, and believe. Worth the trouble. All of this probably sounds like a lot of steps and a lot of trouble, and you're right, it is. That's why most people never do it. But it is worth every bit of effort you put into it. The farther you go in life, the more critical it is that you take time to pause and think. The older you are, the less time you have to stay on purpose and do the things you were created to do. But here's the good news. If you've been diligent in your efforts to grow along the way, you will also be better equipped to fulfill that purpose, even if, if it requires that you to make significant changes or course corrections. Many years ago, my friend Bob Buford wrote a book called The Second Half, and it's fantastic. The entire book is a pause so that growth can catch up with you experience. In it, he encourages readers who've experienced some success in the first half of their lives to stop and think about what they want to do in the second half. Here is some of the advice that he gives. Quote, You will not get very far in your second half without knowing your life mission. Can yours be stated in a sentence or two? A good way to begin formulating one is with some questions and nakedly honest answers. What is your passion? What have you achieved? What have you done uncommonly well? How are you wired? Where do you belong? What are the shoulds that have trailed you during the first half? These and other questions like them will direct you toward the self your heart belongs for. They will help you discover the tasks for which you were especially made. End quote. Never forget that your goal in personal growth is reaching your potential. To do that, you need to keep pausing keep asking questions, and keep growing every day. Applying the Law of Reflection to Your Life 1. Have you created a place where you can consistently and effectively pause and reflect? If not, do so immediately. First, figure out what kind of environment will be good for you. Among the places I have chosen over the years are a rock outdoors, a small isolated room where no one would bother me, and a special chair in my office. Figure out what works for you and stick with it for as long as it's effective. 2. Schedule time to pause and reflect. If you don't, it will always get shuffled off of your to-do list. Ideally, you would spend a short time pausing to reflect at the end of every day, between 10 and 30 minutes, a significant time every week for at least an hour or two, and part of a day several times a day, half a day and an extended time annually, as little as a day and as much as a week. Put these times to pause on your calendar and guard them as you would your most important appointments. 3. Cartoonist Henry Arnold says, The wise man questions himself, the fool, others. The law of reflection will do you little good unless you are intentional in your thinking time. You make yourself intentional by asking yourself tough questions. Where do you need most to grow right now? Is it in self-management? Is there an issue that you can't seem to wrestle down? Are you experiencing a plateau in your career? Are you failing to win at the most important relationships in your life? Do you need to examine or re-examine purpose? Do you need to assess what you should be doing in the second half of your life? Whatever the issue is, create questions around it and spend time writing your answer to those questions during your scheduled times of reflection. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.